Hello everyone, this is going to be a very short intro and a generally short video. My purpose today is for three main things. Number one, to give you the five biotech stocks that in my opinion are still definitely worth the risk versus reward ratio that I'm going to be investing in for the rest of the year. As always, this is not financial advice, not medical advice, it's for entertainment purposes only. The things that I talk about in this video may or may not be true to your own research and see what you find out. Feel free to come back and correct me for anything that you disagree with or you may see that I'm wrong about. But I'm going to discuss the five biotech stocks that I'm going to be investing in the rest of the year. I'm going to give you an outline for each month left in this year and which biotech stock I'm going to cover for each month. And I'm going to give you an update about Relief Therapeutics because things are starting to get exciting again. Once again, the whole purpose in this video, not financial advice, but simply to tell you the five biotech stocks in my opinion, still worth the risk versus reward, and to tell you how I'm going to outline each of them for the rest of the year, and to give you a quick update about Relief Therapeutics. Without further ado, let's get it. Are any biotechs still worth the risk? In my humble opinion, yes. The five on screen are still worth the risk. GlaxoSmithKline, Relief Therapeutics, Cynexis, CRISPR Therapeutics, and Revive Therapeutics. Upcoming Catalyst for Relief Therapeutics NASDAQ uplisting has been well underway since initially announcing it by Relief Therapeutics. Also, their subsidiaries continue leveling up. And by subsidiaries, I mean APR and also Advita Life Sciences. RLF100 is the version of Aviptodil that Relief Therapeutics has the proprietary blend for, and that is part of the reason that they purchased Advita so that they could get all of the intellectual property that Advita had, as well as the versions of Relief Therapeutics RLF100 that they are now touting. It is almost ready to unveil. APR has too much positivity to even explain in such a short time, however, we will touch on a couple of different subjects just to update you. Acer Therapeutics, which is not a subsidiary of Relief Therapeutics, but is in a partnership with them, is almost in full sophomore form. What do I mean by that? Well, they made a rookie mistake by not getting the Acer 001 approved recently. However, that looks that it may be fixed, and we're back again at 85% possible approval rating. RLF also has new money to play with, according to their recent shareholders meeting. Relief Therapeutics stands a good chance to win their court cases. I'm not saying that, but that is what has been said by others who have looked at the situation and who have weighed in with their legal expertise. Also, the money runway looks fantastic on paper. They are holding much more in cash than they owe in debt. That's always a good thing, especially when it comes to a pharmaceutical company. They have a proven methodology that soon should see massive payoff in the upcoming years. I've been very upfront with everyone in that I am holding Relief Therapeutics as a long-term play. I do not expect to sell anything in Relief Therapeutics before 2025 slash 2026. Diving a little bit more into the subject of RLF 100, which I just said in the previous slide is almost ready to unveil, we have a direct quote that just came out from Dr. Ram. He says a Viptodil, when dissolved in saline, is known to have uncertain stability properties, resulting in significant challenges for pharmaceutical supply and use. The development of this novel RLF100 formulation, therefore, has significant clinical and commercial value. In particular, Relief's new formulation appears to be shelf-stable at temperatures suitable for shipping and for long-term storage. Now, what is he possibly referring to when he says dissolved in saline? We do know that a Viptodil acetate is the form that NRXP was using, and it is the salt form of a Viptodil. As you can see there, at Target Mall, which is one of the trusted places in which you can purchase analogs of VIP, it has there that Aviptodil acetate, along with this formula being different than the RLF 100's formula, it is listed as the acetate salt. Now, 
In no way, shape, form, or fashion am I stating that this is, in fact, what Ram is referring to, and also I am not referring to the fact that a vitadyl acetate may be better or worse in its formulation and in its version than RLF 100. I am simply raising the question, as many others have online. I am not an expert in this, and also this is not financial advice, nor is it medical advice. The new stable formulation potentially allows RLF-100 to be delivered via multiple routes of administration for treatment of multiple lung disease indications including sarcoidosis, ARDS, borreliosis, and CIP, all of which Relief seeks to pursue. This is a continuation from the previous quote from Ram. And if you remember, one of the things that I have raised in a previous presentation is that multiple routes of administration are not only necessary, but they are very beneficial and advantageous to whoever can develop the different routes of administration. This can play into the overall scheme of evergreening pharmaceuticals, which is a fantastic method for pharmaceutical companies to continue holding the patent on for a certain blockbuster drug that they may have developed. Not only that, different routes of administration are needed for different stages of different diseases. For instance, a pill form is probably best to take for prevention of COVID-19. You don't want to go and get on IVs or have something sent as a suppository when you're only trying to prevent something. After you may catch the initial stages of COVID-19, however, you will probably not want to go directly to the IV still if you have something like a nebulizer form that you can breathe in. As you get to the later stages, and it's much harder for you to control some of your bodily functions or as certain organ systems may begin to shut down, then IV form is definitely the preferred method of administration. However, in dealing with something delivered via nebulizer versus via IV form or versus a pill form, you have to have different formulations of that same drug for bioavailability so that your body can absorb it in order to extract the full efficacy of the drug. Therefore, hearing something like this coming from Dr. Ram is very reassuring for Relief Therapeutics investors. Upcoming Catalyst for APR APR is a subsidiary of Relief Therapeutics. Now, Goliki is going to be the first FSMP engineered with delivery technology. It is not the first FSMP, however, it is the first to be engineered with their patented form of delivery technology, which is going to keep a constant level of the amino acids. In this case, the Goliki we're specifically talking about is the one for PKU. They have also mastered the art of minimizing the taste, the odor, and the aftertaste. Thus, they have increased compliance. Strictly taking phenylalanine on its own has a horrible aftertaste and therefore has horrible patient compliance, as we'll see in just a minute. However, in their form of it, it has improved physiological absorption of the amino acids expected to generate around 50 million in peak sales. APR OD031. This is a different drug than Goliki that APR will be coming out with that is also for PKU. They have already received ODD status from the FDA for this drug. If you want to know more about ODD status and what that really means for an organization, please go back and review one of my earlier presentations on relief therapeutics in which I delve much deeper and talk about all of the benefits specifically for relief therapeutics and having different ODD statuses as they already have achieved. Not only this, but APR OD031 is simply the PKU drug. They aim to repeat the same process and methodology that they did for developing APR OD031 through the year 2024, also for tyrosinemia, maple syrup urine disease, and homocystinuria. Half a million people globally suffer from PKU alone. Inherited metabolic disorders make up around a $1 billion possible market, and PKU alone makes up half of that. Patient compliance is suboptimal, to say the least, within this population. It ranges from 88% compliance for the 0-4-year-old to 4 year old age group to a mere 33% compliance for the 30-plus-year-old age group. Therefore, it makes a very lucrative opportunity, but also an opportunity to really help a large population of people who otherwise do not have many options available.
PKU patients must get 80 to 85 percent of their daily protein intake for life via FSMP. However, one of the top reasons most cited for non-compliance is the bad taste, the odor, or the gastrointestinal intolerance. It is reportedly so bad that if you look up and you actually look at some of the studies they've tried to do, you will see that one of the reasons the studies have been disrupted is because in the clinical studies, several patients drop out because of the horrible taste or the intolerance within their GI tract. Also, the bad odor is cited frequently. Currently in the U.S., roughly half of all PKU babies diagnosed in newborn screenings have no access to the only available treatment option, and only a third of them have limited access only. Other possible upcoming announcements that would fall under APR upcoming catalysts would be new sales or new results on studies about Nexodin and Sentinox. They are produced as two separate drugs as they have two different functions, however both are different mixtures or percentages of a hypochlorous acid solution. Nexodin falls within the niche category of wound care. Now that's not necessarily the most sexy form of practicing medicine, therefore even though there have been some fantastic peer-reviewed academic journal articles that have been published about it and about its results, you don't really hear too much about it. Sentinox is the new over-the-counter drug we're all expecting to see as the results have been recently published and they've looked fantastic. Physiomimic, Technology, and Teclo are two patented proven forms of drug delivery that APR has that look to be promising for the future also, and this is really what has revolutionized Relief Therapeutics from being just a holding company then to being just a company with subsidiaries that produce different types of medicines to now being an actual platform that can offer different services to other drug companies because now they can package them up into this physiomimic technology or teclo form which is their own patented forms of drug delivery. Possible forthcoming lines of products also include detergents and cosmetics as well. Now you didn't hear that from me that's just through the grapevine so don't be mad at me if that never comes to fruition. Now, Acer 001 is expected to generate around 85 million in peak sales. There's still an 85% approval probability at this stage of development by the FDA. Don't forget, this is a drug that's already proven to work. It's already been to market. Acer has just found a way to make it clinically superior by incre increasing the compliance by odor masking it and taste masking it. Sounds familiar? Well, it should, because Golicky is basically the exact same thing, right? You have APR, they've found a way to take a drug that's FDA approved, they've odor masked it and taste masked it, because these amino acids are known for having horrible taste, horrible smell, and the compliance is horrible because of that. APR has fixed all of that now. So let's look at this for PKU patients. We have APR with the Golicky brand, where they've taste masked and odor masked an already proven drug. Then they have the APR OD031, which is going to be another form of FSMP that they are now building on or building a pipeline within this PKU category of inherited metabolic disorders. Now let's look at Acer 001. Right, that's the collaboration between Acer Therapeutics and Relief Therapeutics, where it's a drug already to market, proven to work, but they found a way to taste mask it and odor mask it, and now they're bringing that to market. Then APR is going to build upon that pipeline within that category of specifically MSUD patients and come out with the FSMP prescription medication form for that to continue further developing that pipeline, which is APR OM033. And so you see the parallelism there, and they're wanting to build this out for other inherited metabolic disorders like tyrosinemia, um, homocysteinuria. So you can really get a clearer understanding and picture now of what they're doing, right? Number one, they're taking a drug already approved and at market. It's been proven to work, right? They take it and a taste mask it and odor mask it. And you can do this with all of the inherited metabolic disorder drugs, right? Because all of them, the fixes are, it just depends on what amino acid your body cannot tolerate 
in foods, so you have to have a drug or medication that gives you that amino acid directly. And so because they have the formula at APR of how to taste mask in an odor mask it, right, they just go down the line of the inherited metabolic disorders. They take the drug already at market that's proven to work. They taste mask it and odor mask it, get it approved as being clinically superior, and then they develop on the back end an FSMP, which is going to complement the redeveloped drug that they just got approved months earlier. And this is a recipe for success where you can go back to the well. This is one of the times where you can go back to the well all the time, multiple times. It's going to work every time because an amino acid is an amino acid with a few small tweaks. And they're the ones who basically dug the whale so they can go back. And they're the only ones that's drawing from the whale because they are the ones with the formula. So this is a recipe for success. I love to see a company like this. It's replicable success, right? That's all I have for us for the updates on Relief Therapeutics. Um, that was the whole purpose, as I said in this presentation, just to give everyone an update of Relief Therapeutics, but then also to give you the schedule of what I plan to do regarding the biotech companies that I see that are out there that are really worth the risk of still investing in. Biotech can be a risky business, but the payoff is very rewarding if you pick the right ones. Here's my upcoming presentations. The next one we'll be discussing this month. Look for it. I'll probably do at least two, maybe three presentations this month on Revive Therapeutics. Some very interesting things going on over there. Y'all go take a look at that RVVTF and go ahead and do a little homework on it. See what you find out and see how that matches up with the things I'll be presenting. I'm waiting to hear back from someone that's going to hopefully give me a little bit more insight. You know, I always try to get a little bit more information if I can than what's out there publicly. But that will be coming out this month, RVVTF. We're going to really delve in deep about that, do two, maybe three videos on that. In September, we'll come back to RLFTF. I think that'll be prime time for it right there. Then October, Synexis. In November, we have CRISPR Therapeutics. And in December, we're going to cover GlaxoSmithKline. And these are the only biotech companies that I see personally that are worth the time and the effort to research and to invest in and worth the risk of investing in them. Now, there's others like Biomarin that you may see a lot of analysts talk about, but I'm looking for rock star potential, things that can really be revolutionary within the field of medicine, but that are also pretty safe bets. And for me personally, again, this is not financial advice, it's not medical advice, right? This is me just talking. It's for entertainment purposes only. These are the five that I personally like. Thanks for staying with me. Look forward to talking to you next time. I'm Dr. Joey saying good luck with your investments. Mm -hmm.